All new electronics will eventually become old and need replacing. And when that time comes, do we ever stop to think about how we should be disposing of these end-of-life electronics? And what do the sandy beaches in California or the Mekong River in Southeast Asia have to do with our electronic waste? It might not be what you think it is. Hi, I'm your host Andrew, and welcome to an Andrew and Zari video. Electronic waste, commonly referred to as e-waste, applies to any device that runs on electricity, ranging from household and industrial appliances to telecommunications equipment and consumer electronics. When electronics reach their end of life, they essentially become e-waste. The choice now is what to do with this waste. You can throw these electronics in the dump or garbage at the front of your house, or you can just keep them laying around the house and end up with half a dozen old smartphones in your desk drawer and a 10 year old broken laptop stored away in the bottom of your closet. <clears throat> Unfortunately, however convenient, both these options will still leave us with an e-waste problem. There is always the option of recycling, but you have to keep in mind the potentially harmful materials in some electronics that cannot be recycled easily. Also the headache of finding out the process of how and where to properly dispose of each device is challenging. Recycling and disposal of e-waste may also involve significant risk to the health of workers and their communities in which they are recycled. It's been estimated that 50 to 80% of electronics intended for recycling never really get recycled, and instead end up in developing countries' landfills to inflict harm on their environment. What makes matters worse is that a lot of electronics have a very short lifespan. This, combined with the high cost of repairs that oftentimes are greater than a new device altogether, creates a constant loop of buying a brand new gadget or appliance and needing to replace it only a few short years later. The issue only seems to be getting worse as technology progresses. Every piece of technology is superseded by a newer generation within the first year or two. No better example of this can be seen than with consumer electronics. The notion that we need the newest generation of smartphones or latest Apple Watch just to keep up with the trend or the latest tech. While we personally have been at fault of this too, our consumption of new technology, coupled with the fast-growing industrialization across the developing world, has created the e-waste problem we have today. While there is record high waste in electronics, we are now also starting to see a shortage of many electronics. More specifically, we're seeing a shortage of the semiconductors found within electronics. Semiconductors, commonly referred to as chips, not those kinds of chips, but computer chips, can be broken down into four main categories. Memory chips, which as the name suggests, are used for storing memory in devices. Microprocessors, which everyone will recognize as what's called the brains of a computer. Examples would be a CPU or GPU. Commodity integrated circuits, which are application specific chips produced in large batches used to perform routine tasks such as a barcode scanner. And lastly, complex system on a chip, or SOCs, which can be seen as an all-in-one chip that includes many of the previously mentioned chips, plus all the circuitry needed to connect them. Examples of this would be the smartphones, tablets, and smartwatches that we have today. Between these four categories of chips, they cover the basis for all modern electronics. At the moment, there is a shortage of chips which is creating a strain on the global economy. Some industries that rely on these semiconductors to manufacture their own products are having to halt or slow down production. The most affected industry by this shortage seems to be car manufacturers, who include dozens of chips in each vehicle. Not enough supply means they cannot continue with manufacturing new cars. Similar can be seen with consumer electronics such as computer parts, where a huge boom in demand has occurred since lockdown began. The process of producing new semiconductors, known as the fabrication process, is also not a simple one, requiring a large initial investment and a lot of experience to be able to produce consistently reliable chips. You have to consider that we're dealing with precision in the nanometers being required to make reliable chips. Currently, only TSMC and Samsung Electronics can produce the most advanced chips at such a large scale, while US's Intel is not far behind. Now, is the global shortage of chips due to fabrication facilities not being able to keep up with demand? That is definitely part of the story. With the current global crisis and increase in demand, huge investments are having to be made by the major chip manufacturers to expand infrastructure and increase supply. The shortage of chips may go even deeper than fabrication though. 
To increase supply, we need to also increase production of the base material required to make these chips. And the critical element in making semiconductors is silicon. Not to be confused with the synthetic see-through rubber-like material silicone, silicon is the perfect material because it can act as both a conductor and an insulator, hence the name semiconductor. While also being the second most abundant element on Earth, oxygen being the first, making it relatively cheap and easy to extract from the Earth. The way silicon is extracted is in the form of sand, and sand is, well, used for everything. The concrete used to construct shopping malls, offices and apartment blocks, along with the asphalt we use to build roads connecting them, are largely just sand and gravel glued together. The glass in every window, windshield and smartphone screen is made of melted down sand. And whether it be natural sand used for concrete, or silica and quartz sand used to make glass and semiconductors, it is estimated we extract roughly 50 billion tons of it every year, the largest extraction of any resource on Earth. The type of sand needed is not the kind found in the Sahara Desert either. It's mined from riverbeds and seashores to forests and farmlands all over the world. A UN report published in 2019 showed that we are extracting sand from the earth at a much greater rate than is being naturally replenished, largely in part due to the urbanization and technology boom that has occurred since the 90s. This type of resource mining is not sustainable as it erodes the riverbeds and seashores, destroys habitats in the forests and farmlands, causing irreversible damage. One of the world's largest sand bedded rivers, the Mekong River in Southeast Asia, has seen its worst drought in over 100 years, threatening the millions of lives that rely on the river's fish as a food source. This is just one example, but it is happening all over the world, mostly in developing countries where there is minimal to no regulation at all. Now, we don't mean to sound alarmist. With everything that's going on in the world right now, and the looming threat of climate change at our doorstep, it can be rather discouraging and mentally draining to keep adding to the list. We want to bring this to your attention and highlight what we can do as a society and individuals. The first step is always awareness. However, even just regulating sand mines across the globe could almost bring this issue to a rest. After all, the issue isn't that we will run out of silicon anytime soon, as it makes up roughly 30% of the Earth's crust. The issue is that we are extracting at a rate that is not sustainable for the environment to keep up with. This will be seen in the erasure of islands, rivers, beachfronts and the wildlife that inhabits them. Sustainable mining could be the solution here. While the majority of the sand mining being done is to fuel the construction industry, the electronics market still plays a key role in this, and if anything, the consumer is the one that ends up paying the price for the limited availability of electronics and skyrocketing prices. Individually, we can do our best with reducing the amount of technology we buy, and while recycling can be confusing, a lot of cities and communities have created websites that share a guide on what and where you can safely dispose of your old electronics. We'll link a few in the description below. On top of that, we as consumers need to be advocating for issues like right to repair, which I won't go into too much detail about as it deserves its own video. But in short terms, it's about fighting for our right to repair electronics without having to go to the original manufacturer for expensive parts and labor, or be forced to buy a new one. While we certainly don't have all the answers, and admittedly have been part of the problem when it comes to disposing of old electronics, there is never a better time than now to start being conscious about our actions. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please consider dropping a like and subscribing. If you have any questions or suggestions for future videos, please leave us a comment. We will read all of your comments. Thank you, and we'll see you on the next one.